Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the President of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm here with Dr. Andrew McKeown, a Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and a Medical Director in our Clinical Biochemistry Laboratory. Thank you for being here with us, Andrew. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Pritt. I'm going to start with some general questions, but we really appreciate uh, your expertise in this area. Why don't we, could you just start off by telling us a little bit about what your role is here at Mayo Clinic? I'm a neurologist uh, by uh, primary training, and um, I did a fellowship at Mayo in autoimmune neurological diseases in uh, 2007 to 2009. And part of that training was in uh, clinical test interpretation in the neuromonology laboratory. And since that time, I've uh, evolved into um, a um, um, certified um, laboratory, clinical laboratory immunologist, and also um, have uh, become a director in the neuromonology laboratory where we uh, do reporting out on clinical tests, but also do antibody discovery work on our research and also uh, validate those tests for clinical use. Well, thank you. Um, I know that you're doing some truly unique work in the neuroimmunology laboratory. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that work and uh, what some of the tests are that you offer? Sure, yeah. So um, our focus, or at least my focus within the lab is in autoimmune central nervous system disease. Mm. So these are disorders that might mimic multiple sclerosis or sometimes might mimic rapidly progressive degenerative dementias and so can are sometimes termed um, encephalopathies, encephalitis, myelopathies or myelitis for, for spinal cord disease, and then movement disorders, which are disorders of the cerebellum causing incoordination and uh, some other related movement disorders. So we basically have found a number of different neuronal antibodies over time that um, are diagnostic in those patients and they may be indicative of an idiopathic autoimmune disease or sometimes a paraneoplastic autoimmune disease mm -hmm. where there is an occult cancer somewhere in the body. So it sounds like the tests are changing based on your own research and, and your clinical work. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So um, we've over the years noted generally multiple times a day on clinical service, neuronal autoantibodies that bind to mouse brain tissue in our indirect immunofluorescence assay, that we don't know the, the, the antigen, the protein hasn't been characterized. Mm -hmm. And so that's really kind of the focus of a lot of the work that myself and my colleagues do. Okay. And so that's resulted in a number of different autoantibodies discoveries in recent years, like GFAP antibody and neuronal intermediate filament antibody. Yeah, I think that would be a real interest to our listeners, um, the recent changes with the autoimmune neurology testing. Can you tell us a little bit more about those tests and how Mayo Clinic is leading changes in this area? Over the course of time, there has been really a very strong growth in the number of analytes available. So initially, uh, a lot of labs would have offered just standalone antibody tests that would be physician selected or would offer kind of quite restricted evaluations and maybe call them a paraneoplastic evaluation. Uh, but in reality, over time, uh, two things have occurred. One is that uh, a number of these antibodies don't have paraneoplastic significance. And so you couldn't kind of say that they have a strong cancer association. And then secondly, just the sheer number of analytes for particular neurological disease states has grown. So for example, uh, for encephalitis, there could be up to 15, maybe more that have been reported in the literature uh, mm -hmm. and similarly for, for movement disorders. 
So as a result, it's kind of hard to really just kind of keep adding them all into one evaluation that you might call sure. a plastic evaluation. So uh, we've kind of veered more towards saying, okay, well, if a patient comes in with a specific neurological presentation, like they come in and the doctor says, okay, this is somebody with six week history of rapid cognitive decline and confusion, we're gonna call this encephalopathy. And then they would order the autoimmune encephalopathy evaluation of serum and spinal fluid. And we've kind of taken it from sort of top to tail, so to speak, starting with encephalopathy, epilepsy, dementia, movement disorders, myelopathy, which is spinal cord disease, um, autonomic disorders, peripheral neuropathies, uh, and so and mycenia gravis evaluations um, for the neuromuscular junction disorders. So really kind of going on an anatomical basis uh, from top to bottom, that really kind of covers everything. Mm -hmm. But also the profiles just contain antibodies that are um, relevant to those phenotypes. You know, I think that that's a huge advantage that we really tend to offer through Mayo Clinic laboratories. People like you who are uh, dual trained and work in laboratory medicine, but also are seeing patients directly and can use your own studies and research, is that we can create these types of panels and algorithms that make sense. Um, instead of just adding analytes onto a never ending list of, you know, and having bigger and bigger and bigger panels. Um, and it sounds like that would be very difficult for our physicians to understand. So to me, it sounds like these more select phenotype specific panels you've come up with probably would increase specificity, reduce confusion, probably reduce cost and turnaround time as well. Would you say that's correct? Yes, I would. I, th I think that the, the other part of it that's important to kind of point out is that uh, really just with the sheer number of tests available it's it would be very hard for physicians to individually select from yeah. just a big long menu of tests and say okay well for encephalitis i need this this and this um uh, first of all that would uh, reduce the diagnostic clinical sensitivity overall uh, considerably and uh, and even in the best case scenarios um the, the literature tells us that up to 50% of patients with these autoimmune diagnoses like autoimmune encephalitis are still seronegative. So being even in the best case scenario, having a negative test does not rule out the diagnosis. Uh, so we need to be doing everything that we possibly can to try to maximize mm -hmm. the sensitivity and specificity with the existing tools that we have. We also anticipate over time that as we discover more and more of these antibodies, that we'll be able to kind of drop them into the relevant evaluations. So it might be relevant for, you know, two, three, or four of the evaluations that I've mentioned, and some might be only relevant to one. Sure. So to really emphasize it for our listeners and, and viewers, how would you say your approach uh, differs from maybe more the more common approaches to autoimmune neurology testing? Well, I think, first of all, um, we offer um, tests as they come out in the literature, and as they're reported, we, we tend to follow up. Uh, within a few years and having a clinical offering, um, even for some antibodies that are quite rare. Uh, and these could be offerings from our, our, our own discoveries in research or from other laboratories where we've uh, been able to replicate the findings and validate the tests. Uh, so that would be kind of a, probably a, a big one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be just keeping updated uh, with, with what's actually out there. Uh, and then uh, secondly, um, we have parsed out our evaluations into clinical phenotypes. We've done that a lot in clinical microbiology as well. And I think that that's a great approach just in general for laboratory medicine. What does the patient look like? What are their risk factors? That should drive the testing, not necessarily just an entire list of everything that could be ordered. Agree. So, well, the way that you've um, created these panels that are phenotype, uh, phenotype driven uh, does, how does that impact the non-neurologists who are ordering these tests or perhaps trying to interpret them? I think that that is a, a potential issue. You know, we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit on this as to what's the, the, the absolute optimum approach. I think, you know, for the most part, I think that this sort of, this sort of testing has a, kind of a level of complexity to it, even for a neurologist, that I think that if a person has neurological symptoms, it's probably a good idea to partner with a neurologist um, anyway, I think that would be good clinical care. Um, but secondly, uh, over time, we are going to try to develop 
cancer specific evaluations, mm -hmm. which would be, say, for instance, in an oncology practice, if a patient is known to have a certain cancer type, like small cell lung carcinoma, and then all of a sudden they develop, uh, you know, a, a rapidly progressive neuropathy, and it's not clear is this chemotherapy related or is this potentially a paraneoplastic disorder, then um, the oncologist would have the opportunity to order a lung cancer specific evaluation. But we would not encourage use of that testing outside of that context. So Dr. McKeown, let's say a physician is seeing a patient that has a rapid onset neurologic condition. And I know that traditionally they would order a test such as what our PAVL test is, P-A-V-A-L, a, a perineoplastic evaluation test. But mm -hmm. this sounds to be a bit more broad than these more tailored phenotype specific tests. So what is the um, approach that you would recommend? The new evaluations incorporate all of the perineoplastic evaluation tests relevant to the neurological phenotype, mm -hmm. as well as the non-perineoplastic antibodies relevant to that phenotype. And it excludes antibodies that are part of the perineoplastic evaluation, but have kind of low specificity that we've identified over time or uh, like voltage gated potassium channel complex antibodies and so on that are have, have, have lower clinical specificity and utility. So, um, so the, these new phenotype specific evaluations are actually quite broad mm -hmm. uh, in their scope. Uh, so if you could imagine any, any patient who come in with a rapidly progressive uh, neurological problem with uh, issues kind of uh, above the neck area. So any uh, rapidly progressive cognitive impairment um, um, or uh, confusion or sudden onset psychiatric disturbance where autoimmunity is suspected, um, then the encephalopathy evaluation of serum and CSF would be appropriate. If it's a, a patient that has uh, predominantly in coordination problems and we're thinking movement disorder then mm -hmm. movement disorders evaluation and then for people where it kind of seems like it's kind of um, predominantly uh, neck and below involving the arms and legs in relation to um, um, uh, weakness loss of sensation bowel and bladder dysfunction uh, that's evolved subacutely then again it's a, a, a myelopathy evaluation so a spinal okay. cord evaluation essentially so I think that people, you know, probably general providers can sort of think think about it in those broad terms as well, to 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 order the appropriate tests and and also our testing takes into account multifocal disorders. So for example, if you have a patient who has an encephalomyelopathy, there are certain antibodies like ANA one or anti HU that's been known to be associated with an encephalomyelopathy. So they have both brain and spinal cord involvement. Anna one is in both profiles. Okay. It does sound like these profiles are uh, rather broad, as you said, for the specific phenotype that the patient is presenting with. So, um, but I can see how this would be a bit confusing for people who aren't used to ordering this. Are, mm -hmm. are there any scorecards or guidelines that you would offer? Um, I suppose there's always that recommendation you mentioned, which is just to call the expert right away as well. In general, I would say that um, if, if, if in doubt, and this is a rapidly progressive neurological disorder, the encephalopathy evaluation almost certainly is going to cover what you need. I think okay. the main thing I'd say is to, to avoid ordering multiple different evaluations as well. It, the key thing will be one serum evaluation, one CSF evaluation, and that will suffice to mm -hmm. cover things. Um, there are other tools that are available. For example, um, there are predictive scores of autoimmune epilepsy, like the APE2 scorecard mm -hmm. that might tell you, okay, there's a high predictive value for this patient having a positive antibody test result based on the score. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, it's, it's fabulous that we have experts like you at Mayo Clinic that it serves as a resource for physicians who aren't used to ordering these types of tests. What will the, uh, these changes in having more spe uh, phenotype specific panels mean for the patients? In my mind, having a more specific panel is, is usually a good thing to avoid misdiagnosis and false positives. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that the we're all the time while we're designing these, and we've been designing these for many years, um, is really very much focused on optimizing 
sensitivity and specificity. So trying to make sure that we get the, the, the highest possible yield for the patient in terms of available antibody tests and bringing those to market and into our evaluations, but then also uh, making sure that we are uh, offering the best possible specificity. Um, and, you know, in our comments then on, in positive results, uh, we also give predictive values of what the chances are of yeah. if the patient has a positive result, what, what, the, what the associated uh, neurological and oncological phenotypes are, knowing that, the, uh, that some antibody test results uh, can be associated with false positives, particularly those detected by immunoprecipitation assays like PQ Ticalcin channel antibody or alpha-3 ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibody, uh, that we also factor into our reports uh, the positive predictive value according to the titer uh, that is additionally helpful for the, the physician in making a, a diagnosis. You know, I think that's quite important. Dr. Maurice and I did a recent podcast on non-invasive uh, neonatal screening and how knowing the positive predictive value can be essential because when you're testing, again, in broad panels uh, that include things that are extremely rare, when you get a positive, it's more likely to be a false positive than a true positive. And so just, it goes back to the basics of laboratory medicine, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, prevalence. And in my own practice, I also try to add helpful comments so that people that get my reports understand what I'm trying to say. So that seems like a good approach. It sounds like it would um, perhaps provide more helpful information for diagnosis for patients in a more rapid manner. Yes, that's the, that's the idea. Yeah, is to, is to, is to try to, to do that. Well, thank you again for joining me today to talk about how you've designed these panels. Um, really a, a great, I think, serving as a role model for how we like to do laboratory testing. Do you have anything else to add that you think our listeners would be interested in hearing? Uh, I think the only other thing I would say is that, as I mentioned, over time, we're trying to add in new antibodies as they're discovered. So these profiles will evolve over time. Uh, there's also sometimes we find um, unclassified neuronal antibodies in the lab that uh, we know that they're ones that, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, that we, we haven't figured out what the protein is yet. And so sometimes those can be informative, but that's more of an informal discussion between the uh, neurologist on call in the laboratory and the provider. And so, you know, if, if there's still a high level of suspicion and our testing is negative, that doesn't rule out the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a call to the lab might, might give you some more informative uh, discussion as well. That's always a good piece of advice. When in doubt, call the lab. We're here as medical directors and, and can provide that additional information. I recommend that highly as well. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you, learning a little bit more about the perineoplastic evaluations that are available at Mayo Clinic. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Britt. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <music>